Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. This is a series of few lectures to refresh our memory about Fourier transforms. Uh, most of you must be already familiar with these aspects. So I will be just reminding uh, ourselves uh, of the beautiful instrument we have, which uh, Fourier gave to us, and uh, have, you know, this is impact across a range of fields, uh, as you already know. The basic idea, as you all know, is given a function, given certain curve or waveform or uh, something as a function of something. It can be viewed as a linear superposition of sinusoids of various periods of oscillation, each scaled and phase shifted appropriately to collectively match the function. So this is like the model fitting, uh, if you like, and the, like the polynomial fits that we routinely do instead of the different order components which come with the coefficients here we have a set of sinusoids coming with their coefficients so the idea is basically similar to many other linear transforms uh, but here the so-called basis functions uh, the component functions are sinusoids i will be stressing this and we'll be using this property on and off in several places that this is a linear transform so the important thing to recognize or appreciate is uh, there is no change in information content across the domains. So when there is a function and you take its Fourier transform, you get information in another domain, which is the Fourier domain of the original function. And you will find that there is neither a reduction nor enhancement of information. So it's like accurately translating across languages a given piece of text. And so that even a reverse translation uh, returns the original message. And this uh, requires certain qualities. So there is uniqueness in this representation uh, in terms of the complex factors that the coefficients we will get as a function of frequency, frequency just being the inverse coordinate of whatever domain in which uh, function is represented because we have invoked periodicities, uh, periodic functions, there will be an associated frequency. This does not necessarily correspond to the temporal frequencies that we often talk about as a time domain representation and, and the corresponding uh, spectral domain representation. This, these frequencies might have different tags, uh, as we will see. Sometimes there'll be temporal frequencies, there'll be uh, spatial frequencies, uh, and so on and so forth. But the uniqueness is assured that this representation, you cannot get multiple answers um, for this. And this is ensured by some basic quality of these basis functions that we are talking about. They are mutually orthogonal in nature. What does it mean? That their dot products are zero. So if you like, you can think of multidimensional space in which each one of these sinusoids represents an axis, uh, which is orthogonal to every other axis. And we are basically taking the function at hand and taking its projections along each one of these axes. And the projected value uh, is what is the coefficient. But this is not required. This is just to uh, state for completeness. So we have a given basis function, which cannot be produced by any linear combination of other basis functions. And this is what we have when, you know, we have orthogonal axis uh, or system of orthogonal functions. So in the, in the Fourier transform, the basis functions, as we said, are sinusoids. And the net correlation between any two sinusoids of different frequencies will then have to be zero. You can convince yourself that if you take one sinusoid, and multiplied by another sinusoid of different frequency, you can write the product as a combination of or sum of the sum frequency and the difference frequency. And when you do that, you will see that both of them are oscillatory functions. When integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity, they will give you net value zero. It is only when the frequencies match then the difference in frequencies is zero, that there will be a non-zero correlation. So this is apparently true even between sine and cosine functions, even if they are at the same frequency. So uh, what else the basis function set should ensure? 
So while this is like a language that we're going to use, uh, we have a different language. We have something written in one language. We are trying to translate it into another language. We need precise possibilities of you know use of terms in the other language that one word cannot be mimicked by other combinations of other words. At the same time, the vocabulary should be rich enough to exhaustively uh, sort of address all possible versions of the text. So what it means is uh, we need mm, the set to suffice uh, to represent any given finite function as a linear superposition of these basis functions. So in other words, the basis function set should have the quality that the functions themselves should be mutually exclusive and collectively they should be exhaustive. They should cover all the possibilities of, uh, of their collective manifestation to represent the thing we need to. And sinusoids as basis functions do satisfy this requirement. So this is the basic definition uh, that you have uh, seen uh, several times. What is written here is the Fourier domain value at some point s and that is given by an integral. We will see the discrete versions later but here is a continuous integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function that we want to Fourier transform f of x times e to the power minus i x times s dx. There is a reverse relation as well which is uh, called the inverse transform and there is a factor extra factor here other than the rest of the things being sort of just switched between capital F and small f and the sign of uh, the exponential is opposite. Now these factors are the, uh, the, the correct factors um, but some people would like to keep some level of symmetry and they use this other version which is shown on the right side where the scale factor or the normalization factor is uh, made to look similar in both the forward and the inverse transform. We will see the meaning of this a little later, but right now it's like taking the function, multiplying it by complex version of the sinusoid at frequency s and integrating it doing the multiplication and integrating it over the entire range of x. So this, if you like, is the correlation that we're computing, a spot correlation with the function f of x with a mask which we have produced. We say, you know, this is the frequency at which we want to know the um, contribution of that particular sinusoid which is. Uh, the other version is almost like the definition that we have where we have these coefficients multiplied each one of them is accompanying a complex sinusoid given by this uh, e to the power. So this is like the way we said we want to superpose large number of sinusoids with appropriate factors multiplied by it. Uh, with appropriate weightages, such a way that the superposition leads to uh, the function that we want to model. And this is the function where we are analyzing and filtering out the contribution that corresponds to the sinusoid with frequency s. So there are uh, conditions which it need to satisfy to have a Fourier transform, um, a valid Fourier transform. And uh, there are much more detailed conditions which I'm not going to go into, but I will say the naive ones. Uh, and the first one of them is that the, the finiteness uh, in some sense, the integral of modulus of fx, regardless of the sign from minus infinity to plus infinity exists. So that's the finiteness condition. And if there are any discrete jumps, uh, then they should be finite number of such. Okay, any discontinuities uh, in fx are finite. So there are the appeals of Fourier transform are many. I will not be able to cover them here, but I've just picked some things that are most relevant to us today. 
and in the context of the other course that you are uh, actually attending. So there are important Fourier pairs relevant to optics that we uh, employ in, uh, in the way we measure our uh, astronomical signals. Uh, this is in general, and of course, they are even more specifically relevant to astronomy applications, instrumentation, and signal processing involved in on the way uh, after we actually capture the signal and uh, before we actually distill the information out of it. Uh, we need to massage it in a variety of ways, and all those steps also involve application of Fourier descriptions. There are people who use, uh, without the context that we are. Uh, most interested in, uh, they would simply use this as an efficient computational tool when they need to uh, convolve some two functions. As you know, that uh, convolution and correlation involve point to point multiplication after shifting one of the functions after it's flipped or non flipped, depending on whether it's convolution or correlation. And an endpoint uh, operation like this, uh, endpoint function, will take essentially n square computations and uh, that can be efficiently reduced by using a version of Fourier transforms which is called the fast Fourier transform where you Fourier transform the functions do the needful and Fourier transform it back to achieve effective convolution and correlation between functions. You will also find that uh, with this exact uh, unique translation between the two domains and with assurance that no information is lost when we want to make measurements of certain measurements of certain parameter that parameter may not be readily measurable or not easily measurable in the domain that we uh, actually seek the information but if there is a Fourier domain associated with it sometimes there are examples and one of the classic examples is of the aperture synthesis in interferometry that we actually go to that other domain, make the measurements and translate it back to the domain where we are interested in using the information to get insight about the um, whatever measurements are supposed to reveal. One can opt for a feasible domain in which measurements can be made and this is facilitated by the, the Fourier. Very beneficial and visualizing the function in uh, its event in a given domain. And the other thing to this later, uh, and stress this point, and if I forget to, uh, please remind me, the energy across the two uh, domains is conserved. And so you can imagine that if in one of the domains, the description is more compact, you will find the area under the modular square of the function being equal, the width equivalent width being narrower, you can easily expect tallness or the amplitude of uh, this, the description being uh, correspondingly high. And that makes an enormous difference in the way you can detect these presence of these signals um, uh, in the presence of other contaminants that might exist. So in terms of contrast, uh, you will find more compact the function is, it will have better contrast. Hopping from one domain to another uh, is not difficult at all. Once you are tuned to this, it's uh, indeed real fun and uh, you will find it empowering too. So we're going to look at a few things. One of the first things that people talk about in the context of um, functions in general uh, is the oddness and evenness of the function. So in general, a function will have uh, both even and odd parts and they can be found out by uh, suitably combining the the functions as described on the positive and negative side of the origin, uh, exactly the way uh, written here on the right side. And this is just a pictorial representation of it. So function in general, uh, finite function in general, uh, can be represented by a combination of even and odd function. And why is one mentioning that? Because you will find that in the Fourier transform relation where we had the exponential factor, where e to the power uh, i times x times s, you will find uh, that can be represented also as sine and cosines, and it will be uh, cos of sx plus i times sine of sx. Now that 
combination itself is a mixture of odd and even functions. As we know, cosine is an even function. Uh, sine uh, is an odd function. And so when you take a Fourier transform, we are really having this fx times the, that exponential factor. And if you were to write it this way, you will find that an even function multiplied by an odd function will integrate to zero and vice versa, other combination as well. And so it's only the even function with the even part will give you possibly non-zero value. So those are used as sometimes separately in terms of odd and even components of it uh, being appropriately filtered and uh, the transformation is done not by the general complex function really it's done by the cosine function separately and the sine function separately by picking the selectively even and odd parts of the function and when that happens it will um, so instead of getting four terms you basically get two terms when you have some one sum multiplied by another sum you normally expect four terms but because of the odd even combination leading to net value zero after integration you will find that you really land up taking cosine transform of an even function and sine transform of an odd function so this is how it will look and uh, so you, there are properties then you can begin to appreciate if you have a real and even function the fourier transform will be real and even you, if you have a real and odd function there will be imaginary and odd there are a variety of uh, possibilities here the one i'm underlining here is the one that we often encounter uh, in terms of uh, let's say the sky distribution which is real and asymmetric there the fourier description is uh, complex and hermitian symmetry what we mean by hermitian symmetry is the the negative side value in whatever diametrically opposite uh, location uh, the value is complex conjugate of the one that we have on the four side the other uh, versions are you know just for academic interest most of the time we encounter uh, this and maybe as you know sometimes special case of uh, uh, real and even in very very rare cases this is a pictorial representation of what i uh, you know, just showed as a in form of a table this is a table of pictures and you can uh, see that the one that we have interest in is is out here where this is real and asymmetric and that will have a hermitian symmetric fourier description what it means is the real part is even and uh, imaginary part is odd if you were to represent this as uh, amplitude and phase the amplitude will be um, even and the phase uh, will uh, change sign based on the side of your arm. So in general, uh, uh, an harmonic wave uh, it can be thought of as some sort of sinusoids. This is what we've been saying uh, right from the beginning. This is just an example uh, to show you uh, how two sinusoids, which are shown here, one in thick line and one in faint line, and the dotted uh, dashed line is the sum. And uh, it will, you know, this can be made richer by adding more and more. If there were a sort of movie-like thing where we add subsequent contributions, uh, you will see how it develops into a, a completely unrecognizable pattern from the original individual constituents. The, the example chosen here is where the, uh, the two sinusoids chosen are not harmonically related. If you were to choose uh, harmonically related uh, contributions and in, add them in phase, with specific phase relationship, you can uh, get variety of uh, periodic waveforms or periodic uh, functions and one of them uh, chosen here for example is a square wave so how this builds up with contributions from different different uh, harmonics is shown here so this is just the fundamental matching uh, and of course there is a lot to be matched uh, between the function that we want to model and uh, so there's superposition of other harmonics required and there it is um, as you do the correct measure appropriate amplitudes you will find that you begin to come closer and closer to the sharp descriptions so all the sharpness requires and implies uh, higher harmonics and so you will find uh, things spread away from the origin when there is truncation in the 
domain from which you are getting this description after Fourier transform. So truncation in one domain leads to uh, spread and ringing in the other domain. These are a series of examples. Um, most of them are familiar to you. This function we already looked at. This is a rectangular window um, and it's been talked about in the other lectures uh, and which has a Fourier transform, a sink function. The Gaussian transforms to another Gaussian. The widths will be such that if this Gaussian is wide, this Gaussian will be narrow. The widths are inversely related to each other. Uh, you can have a sink square function, which will have a transform, which is triangular uh, pattern or the vice versa. If you have a function which is uh, just constant as a function of x, its Fourier transform under limit and normalization by the width over which the function is uh, used and uh, Fourier transform is computed, you will find it will give you a Dirac delta function. Uh, you will find that uh, if you have a cosine wave, it is represented by two Dirac delta functions at uh, symmetrically located uh, points about the origin and they will have the same amplitude and same phase. Sine function, for example, uh, will have similar locations because the frequency is the same, but a different phase relationship and actual different phases at each one of these points. So this will be minus 90 and plus 90 based on which way the function is defined. And so that will be imaginary for the sine x. Uh, and uh, if you were to have uh, i sine x, uh, you will get a real function, uh, but with 180 degree phase shift. So as I was uh, mentioning in uh, another context uh, that there is a general Fourier conjugate variable relationship uh, where uh, one domain uh, quantity is related to the other domain quantity by uh, inverse uh, in general. And so are the typical uh, scales on which the function um, has significant or has an equivalent spread. So here, uh, for example, uh, there is a there is a Gaussian uh, with certain width, uh, and you will find that uh, that width delta t is related to the width in the other domain delta nu by the inverse. And so this actually is the description of or another manifestation. Uh, a reminder of the uncertainty principle. Uh, so you will find that delta t delta nu at best will be equal to one. In certain cases, it might be even greater than one. So the ones that we often encounter in uh, in uh, signals and contexts like that, or even the spectral measurements that we do, or the energy time um, context uh, is the is the pair frequency and time. We know that we, for, in, for our interest in knowing the intensities of uh, astronomical sources, we would be wanting to look at the power spectrum, how the power varies as a function of frequency. And that, you know, can be, um, will be related to autocorrelation of the time domain signal as a function of uh, relative shifts in the version of the function with its own replica shifted when we try to slide it on each other to see the level of similarity between the function and its shifted version, we will get a description of the autocorrelation function. So this is, uh, in the Gaussian case, of course, it's uh, you know very easily demonstrable, uh, this particular relation. So it also means that uh, if we make measurements of some quantity V of t on time scales, which are less than one upon the delta nu, the spread in the frequency, you will find that things are pretty correlated. That means the information is not very different on time scales within interval, which is inverse of the spread in the spectrum. So that's why they 
they don't give any additional information and then that's why they are, they should be treated as not being independent so this will be uh, relevant in some other context when you will be dealing with you know the number of measurements you do and uh, and so on so the spread in frequency and the correlatedness in time are related to each other and you need to take that into account while sampling or you know collecting information that you would do at what intervals it's beneficial uh, to collect the information there is no benefit from collecting it at much finer intervals and that, that's what uh, the sampling uh, theorem states uh, given by nyquist so the maximum information is gained by sampling the function at uh, intervals of one upon twice the um, uh, spread in frequency and nothing really changes on the shorter time scales and that's understandable because the content the, there are no no contributions in the spectrum no oscillating functions which uh, oscillate on the time scales uh, finer than the the inverse of the bandwidth there are many theorems associated with fourier transforms uh, one uh, should uh, note them so that uh, they uh, they can be readily used whenever we uh, have slightly different situation than the normal um, so for example if you were to uh, scale one of the axes x axis um, by a factor a you will find uh, nothing really changes in the other domain in terms of its uh, overall shape and uh, and the detailed description except the scaling of the axis by the um, by the inverse factor uh, so if you have the factor a in where the a x is scaled the s will be uh, scaled down by the same factor and this is the normalization factor which will come which you can appreciate in variety of ways uh, including uh, simply coming from the change of variables uh, in your normal integrals as we already noted uh, we have linearity these are linear transforms and so uh, a simple sum without even any scale factors of uh, function let's say two arbitrary functions f and g which each one of them has a fourier transform capital f and capital g will have a fourier transform the combination will have a fourier transform of the combinations uh, i mean that will be the same similar scaled combination of their fourier transforms respectively if you shift a function you can see that this will again you can affect a change of variable uh, you can absorb that in the exponential factor uh, while you compute the fourier transform and uh, it's not difficult to show that it will lead to the the same fourier transform as you had earlier except an additional phase gradient and so what you have is this e to the power uh, this factor minus uh, i times 2 pi times a times s where the magnitude of this is unity and the phase is changing linearly with both the amount of shift you have given and so you can say it's a linear gradient proportional to uh, the shift that you have given so the rate of change of this phase as a function of s is proportional to a uh, when you take uh, a function uh, and modulate it or if you take a sinusoid and a cosinusoid and modulate it with the function um, of interest you will find that you create what are called the side bands uh, in the in the fourier domain so the original fourier transform uh, description will now get shifted to two locations one with a shift given by this uh, the sinusoid that you are using uh, its frequency and uh, similarly on the other side of the original uh, location so uh, you will find that around these two places on positive and negative side of the omega you would place the fourier description that you had earlier effectively other than the scale factors uh, here half of so we will deal with this a little more uh, in detail uh, you have uh, convolution you can have situation where two functions are convolved with each other and this is one of the most uh, powerful results uh, of uh, in this context uh, we, we will rely on this and uh, encounter this uh, routinely 
when two functions are multiplied uh, sorry when two functions are convolved their fourier transform of the convolution is the simple product of the individual fourier transforms uh, as shown here autocorrelation which is you know slight change in the way the formula looks like for convolution but it has very different meaning uh, but it mathematically it can be still uh, written pretty much the same way as if one is taking the function g to be the f star of minus x in which case uh, you will find you will get f of s times g here which is which would be f star and uh, you will find that amounts to a modulus of fs uh, whole square and this is the relation that we were talking about uh, where the autocorrelation in one domain has a fourier transform which is a power spectrum in the other domain so this is measuring the power as a function of frequency or s in this particular case in general there are other things which uh, right now may not be too relevant but for completeness uh, one can mention that if you take a derivative of the function if f of x has a fourier transform then f dash x which is a first derivative with respect to x will have a fourier transform which is the original fourier description of f of x times a factor which is uh, proportional to the proportional to s so it is like taking uh, original uh, function original transform uh, output and multiplying it by a simple straight line with with this uh, scale factor or with the slope and so what uh, this immediately tells you is that uh, at s is equal to 0 the value will go to 0 regardless of what the f of s was similarly there are relations about the uh, integration which i'll not go into so this is one of the important relationship that I was uh, referring to earlier. This is, I knew this as a Parseval's theorem uh, in the context of uh, discrete transforms, but in the continuous uh, case, it's called uh, Rayleigh uh, condition and Rayleigh theorem, which is essentially a statement of energy conservation across the two domains. So what you have is a function here whose modulus square defines the power or uh, spectral density depending on which domain you are in and that is integrated over the corresponding domain to get the total energy across that domain and that is conserved through the Fourier transform. You can make this as a general power estimation not necessarily with the self modulus square but that's uh, just like the cross power difference, uh, cross power description that we will encounter in the context of cross correlations. Let's look at some of the uh, typical uh, pictures to see and uh, begin to appreciate how the hopping from one domain to other domain relates to uh, different functions. So here you have a version, this is the same thing because some of the axis here could not be seen. I sort of kept this. So this is the origin, uh, the right of the center, and this is a symmetric uh, window about zero, which has a Fourier transform sync, as you know. But as soon as you shift this function by an amount which is shown here, you will find that it becomes a first a complex function. And if you compute the phase by taking the imaginary part divided by the real part and take tan inverse of it and plot that as a function of the S coordinate here, you will find that has a linear gradient. So uh, it's only the uh, linear phase gradient that we have, which is proportional to the shift, no change in amplitude. So if we were to square the, this green signal and the, and the, the violet one, and uh, add them and uh, they take square root to get the amplitude, it will follow exactly the original function of the unshifted version. Let me just mention the convolution aspect. So one of the important uh, aspects, as I said, uh, is uh, that we'll be using on and off is uh, that when let's say h of x is a uh, is a convolution of two functions f and uh, small f and small g defined like uh, the way shown here then you can show that uh, the fourier transform of h which is let's say capital s capital h as a function of s is a simple product of the component fourier transforms 
here of course you can see that as as in multiplications the order here does not matter it does not matter where f was convolved with g or g was convolved with f okay as against correlation we will see that it does not have that uh, commutation property so you can have multiple uh, convolutions in any order okay and you will find the fourier transforms of the net will be a simple product of the component fourier transforms uh, and this is an example of uh, one convolution example where you have some function and it's uh, this is this fourier transform now you multiply that by a cosine uh, a signal or cosine of uh, 2 pi x you will find that this function will act as a modulating function and uh, where i said the same information will now be staggered at two locations about the frequency of the, the sinusoid and this is what has happened the same information has it has produced two replicas at the locations of the fourier transform of the cosine function cosine function had a fourier transform which was symmetric delta function direct delta functions at so you had a situation where two delta functions now this being a multiplication it's a convolution of two delta functions with this function and this is what uh, it has produced we'll come to this aspect of this being a replica and produced at every location of this delta function uh, of one of the descriptions so here uh, you, all that all that has been done should just to illustrate how this depends how the location of it depends nor the the shape of course of this individual feature does not change because that's the original uh, feature shape only location of it will change depending on the frequency of the modulating uh, modulated signal so what this is the like the you know oscillating function and this is being modulated by our function f of x okay you can also have a case where you know they have the frequency um, is reduced so much that these two come so close and they merge into but not quite uh, return to this because there is a finite frequency although very low okay i will probably stop here uh, and uh, take the correlations uh, aspects in the next lecture